Okay, first of all, uh, like I said, I would just like to uh, thank all of you for being here today. And I hope that you guys have been able to gather some information and hopefully make some contacts that make your ranching experience a little easier and maybe uh, help you to be a little bit more successful than uh, maybe what you've already been. But um, I I'm really appreciative to the speakers that we've had. Uh, they've brought a tremendous amount of information. And again, we, we have, uh, as a company, we have utilized the services of most of the speakers that have been here. Um, and, you know, the two gentlemen from Texas A&M, their presentations are incredible and the knowledge they've shared with us. And um, I, I just, I'm, I'm really thrilled with how this day has come off so far. Our, our goal, like I said, is really just to provide as much transparency and openness and build relationships and bridges between people within the industry because it's our belief that it makes our investment in wildlife stronger by having your investment wildlife stronger. So again, thanks. Um, and so for those of you that are unaware, um, my name is Brian Gilroy and I am, I don't like using the word CEO, but I'm the co-founder of Wildlife Partners. Uh, my brother and I, um, who he's not here, he's hunting today. Um, <clears throat> we, we started this company in 2016. Uh, my background is not that of a rancher. Um, I grew up here in San Antonio, and my background is that I was in the oil and gas business um, in the financial services side for about 20 years. And so my mind, while I'm very enthusiastic about wildlife and I'm very enthusiastic about conservation, my mind tends to gravitate more towards the capitalism side of the wildlife industry. And so when I started the company in 2016, uh, my belief was that we could have a tremendous impact on an industry that ex had, has existed for a long time, but that with the implementation of some, uh, I think, innovative business strategies, I felt like we could really advance the ball related to um, profitable wildlife conservation uh, with a model that didn't focus strictly on hunting. And so that's really what our focus has been. And so over the last five years, um, our company has, we've sold from a revenue standpoint, I think we've surpassed hundred million in revenue strictly in the sale of wildlife over the last five years. This year, it'll be somewhere in the 32 to $34 million range, just selling animals. And we're just one company. You know, there's hundreds of brokers in the industry that sell animals. There's thousands of people that own ranches that are breeding wildlife. And we're just one company. And the opportunity that exists for people in this industry is, I, I personally think it's, it's, it's astronomical. And I think that we're, while the industry has been around a long time, we're at a place in the industry where the opportunity is just tremendous. So that's really what my presentation is gonna be about today. So um, like other speakers, I kind of have an agenda of what we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna give you a little idea of the history and then talk about the marketplace, both on the buying and the selling side. And then I, one of my favorite subjects is tax um, and how not to pay tax in a legal way. And we'll talk a little bit about market stability and pricing today, because I think this is a pretty common subject people ask about. And then I will open the floor to some questions. So I'm not gonna go through this slide in great detail. The purpose of this slide is simply to demonstrate to you that while there's not an enormous amount of scientific data um, or even statistical data related to the history of the industry, there, there is data related to articles that have been written and publications that have been put out. And this industry, it actually began in the late 20s or in the early 1930s when the King Ranch brought Neil Guy Antelope um, and they did that for diversification. Their hope was is that they could bring in some new species that would offset the fluctuations in the price of cattle, and they'd been successful in doing that. But then in the 60s, we really started to see some significant growth. And the main story that I like to share from this is that the animals that we have here in Texas, they have primarily originated from zoos. Um, you know, there's this idea that people have in New York City that Billy Bob Bubba oil man is bringing these boatloads of animals over from Africa and then we're throwing them behind a high fence and shooting them. And that, that just isn't the case. What I mean, that may happen some, but the importation doesn't happen. What does happen is that America's zoos breed animals 
And then when they run out of room, they ship them to Texas. And so the result of giving Texans something is that we tend to make it bigger, as the saying goes. And this talks a little bit about the species. And so you should have a printout that you can read, but the bottom line is we've gone from 13 species in 63 to 51 species in 1979 um, to in 2000, uh, where is it, in 2007, there was a study done by Texas A&M and they estimated that the economic impact of this industry at that time was $1.3 billion. And the growth of the industry since 2007 is astronomical. So one of the things that I learned being in the investment world is that if you've ever made an investment in the stock market or anything else, you're required to get a prospectus. And that prospectus gives you full disclosure. And it's the idea is, is that buyers, in order to motivate people to buy an investment, they need to be able to trust the marketplace. They need to be able to trust that a seller is giving them the whole story, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And what I discovered when I first got in this is that that just didn't really exist. There wasn't a lot of data that was being given when someone would buy an animal. And the flip side of that is if I own an asset and I don't have the ability to sell it in a, in a relatively easy manner, well, then my asset really isn't an asset. It's just something that I own. It, it's not, I can't liquidate it. And so a great example of this would be is if anybody's ever invested in penny stocks, <clears throat> there are penny stocks that have very low volume. You can buy them pretty regularly, but when you go to try to sell them, the market makers don't allow you to sell them. And so you're stuck with your penny stock. So as you see the price fluctuating, you can't get rid of it. So with respect to exotic wildlife, I found that the same thing existed to some extent, is that if you had animals on your ranch and it came time to sell them, there was no easy way to go get rid of them. And so you were kind of stuck. And what I saw is that that really had the industry stuck in more of a hobby mode rather than an investment mode. It didn't mean that it didn't have a purpose or it didn't have value. It's just that landowners, as a general rule, didn't look at these animals as an investable asset. <clears throat> and I guess one, one way that was evidenced is that if you owned a ranch in, let's just say, 2005, and you had 100 head of cattle on your ranch, when you sold the ranch, your cattle came with you. It never occurred to you to leave your cows there. But if you had a ranch and you had 100 blackbuck on it or 100 axis on it, you didn't get any value for those axis or blackbuck when you sold your ranch, and you certainly didn't get to take them with you. And that's a totally different today than it was back then. So um, I think that's just more a function of people looking at this more of, a, of an investment. <clears throat> so look at those two beautiful guys in that truck. I think that's Tad Honeycutt. So um, the first thing to consider is the difference between retail and wholesale. And this is something that I saw was never communicated in any way, shape, or form when I first got into this. And there is a difference between retail and wholesale. And the difference is, is that when you buy an animal and that animal is being delivered to your ranch, you are going to pay the retail price. If the flip side is, is that you are gonna go out and catch that animal, whether it be with a helicopter, a net gun, a dart gun, or a trap, you're gonna end up paying wholesale for that animal. And there is a, there is a, there's a difference between these two prices. Our company, um, the, the general, our, our goal, we are a wholesale buyer, is that we are trying to buy at 70% of retail. So our margin, gross margin, is about 30%. So that, I can tell you that historically in the past, I saw deals when I was first buying animals where that margin was astronomically different. A landowner might have been getting paid $1,500 for an animal, and that animal was getting sold for $8,000 just simply because he didn't know any better. He didn't know what the market really was. And so as the industry has grown, that's changing quite a bit. But it is all about the catch in terms of how much it is that you're going to pay for an animal when you buy it and when you sell it. So purchasing exotics, it requires an understanding of the market. And there are four ways that you can buy animals. You can buy them at auction, you can buy them through video sales, you can buy them from brokers, or you can buy them directly from breeders. And knowing the pros and cons of each one of these things is critically important to your success as it relates to being a buyer. 
So the first thing we'll talk about is a live auction, where you've got an animal that's running through a ring. And these have been around a long time. They're, they're not new, they've been around a long time, and they have served a purpose, and today they still serve a purpose. But the pros are is that you get this immediate acquisition. And so you don't have to wait. If you try ordering a car today, one of the most frustrating things is you have to wait. And so as a result, a lot of us don't buy. And so the same thing is true with exotics. If you have to wait, well then, that's just not terribly fun. You don't get the impulse element of it. It's not terribly exciting. And so when you're at a live auction, you do get the benefit of buying immediately. These auctions occur all the time. There's, there's websites that have auctions that are in a barn. You can look at them online. You can buy them any day of the week. And those exist right now today. There is a variety of species. So you have a lot to pick from. In some cases, the prices can be much lower than buying in other places. So there are some deals to be had at these auctions. The downside is, is typically you're not gonna get any kind of a guarantee when you buy the animal. You don't get really any information whatsoever about the seller. This animal has passed through at least two hands. In other words, someone caught it and then they brought it to the auction. So this is now two hands this animal's been through before it gets to you. So you're the third person. Limited disclosure about the animal, and there is a high mortality compared to other, other venues that you're buying animals. And the main reason is this is an extraordinarily stressful event for an animal. So when you have an animal that's caught, put in a trailer, and then it's driven to the auction, it's run through the barn, then it's run through the ring, then it goes back into the stall, and then it goes on your trailer. It's late in the day by the time you get back to your ranch and it's dark, you open the trailer, you're releasing it in the middle of the night on a new piece of property it's never been to and it doesn't know where the water is. So it, it walks the fence, like, like most animals are gonna do in general. But this is a high stress environment. But these, these auctions do serve a purpose. There is a value for them. They can be worthwhile and there are some deals to be had. Then you have video sales, which this is getting to be a bit more popular. Um, you've had the Exotic Wildlife Association conducting these auctions for quite some time. They've been very successful in doing so. And these are a little different than the live auction where the animal's going through the ring. These animals are not in a barn. In other words, they haven't been captured in most cases. So they're still at the ranch. They're still out walking around on the property or they're in the pen that they've grown up in. And so the pros are is that these auctions are a ton of fun. I mean, you get to meet a lot of people like you do here. There's generally quite a bit of drinking going on. It can get kind of competitive. It's, it's kind of exciting. You do get immediate acquisition. There are some guarantees. The seller is typically identified, so you know you're who you're getting your animal from, and there's more information available to you. The downside is, is they don't happen very often. They're getting to be a little bit more frequently frequent, but they don't happen all the time. Payment is made before delivery, so most people buying animals they're kind of accustomed to paying when the animal gets there or even afterwards. In this case, you're paying up front and it may be weeks or it could be a couple of months before the animal shows up at your property because there could be 400 animals sold at that auction and they've all got to get delivered. So you're in line for delivery. <clears throat> but there, there is typically some sort of a warranty, but it is in fact limited. Then you're gonna have brokers, which I'm sure everybody in the room has had the wonderful pleasure of meeting lots of brokers. Some of them are great, some of them are not, but they have played a huge role in driving this industry and getting animals on ranches all over the state of Texas. So the pros are is some of them offer a guarantee. There are hundreds to choose from. You get a personal relationship and that, that guy right there, he is back there. And he is going to be great at personal relationships. That's Jared Steinbach, by the way. He runs our sales force. So when you have a broker that you're working with that you've got a relationship with, you will end up getting some education and consulting depending upon their experience. Delivery is typically going to be included. Some of them are going to charge you, but not all of them. And you do get full disclosure from some, some of the brokers. You may not get full disclosure from all of them, but you do from some. The downsides are is that not all brokers are credible. And I, I'm, I'm sure that's the case in every industry. It doesn't matter what it is, but um, not all of them are credible. Not all of them can offer a guarantee and not all brokers are willing to provide any kind of animal history. They don't want you to know where they got it because they're afraid you're gonna go around them and go call that ranch or whatever. They don't wanna let go of their honey hole. So you don't really get a lot of information about where it came from, how old it is, what its history is. It could have come from a sale barn for all you know. 
Then there are breeders, and this can be either a retail or a wholesale transaction. So the pros are is typically breeders do warranty their animals. You are gonna get all of the known history of this animal provided the breeder has it. They are generally gonna offer you some help and education. You will, in some cases, get superior animals. Breeders are really working at trying to produce the best stuff they can. So some of the more attractive animals as it relates to horn size, you can oftentimes get those directly from the breeders. And you do develop a personal relationship. We work with hundreds of ranches directly. Um, having relationships with breeders is a, is a really a, it's a great experience because we end up getting this knowledge base that extends far beyond our own. The downside is, is they don't always have the ability to capture. There's lots of landowners that they breed, uh, they have animals all over their property, but they don't know how to catch them. Um, so you, you then have to bring a broker in or you have to find someone to catch them for you or you have to catch them yourself. They have limited capture experience. So a lot of breeders, because they want to get maximum value for the animal, they want to do the capture work. Well, there's a difference between someone who's caught 50 animals and someone who's caught 20,000 animals. And so sometimes you buy an animal from a breeder and they caught the animal, but they don't necessarily have all the experience related to capture that you might want them to have. And so you're getting a great animal, but there is some capture risk associated with that. And typically breeders are only going to sell seasonally, so you don't get to snap your fingers on demand and make an order and get what you want. And in some cases, when you're dealing with breeders, the prices are going to be above retail. In other words, because they have superior animals, they're going to charge significantly more for their animals than you might see at an auction site or from a broker. So places to purchase summary. These are some of the questions that I would personally encourage you to ask yourself when you're buying animals. You know, Joe talked a little bit about trying to avoid the impulse buy. But what I would ask you to consider is, am I getting enough information? With what these animals cost today, you would never in a million years go out and spend forty or $50,000 on a vehicle without knowing what kind of motor it has in it or knowing what the warranty is, or knowing what kind of information that you need for a vehicle. But yet we find ourselves doing that with animals all the time. So do you have enough information? Is there a warranty of any kind? In other words, is the person you're buying this animal from giving you any kind of an assurance whatsoever that this animal is gonna live once it gets on your property? Are you gonna get any assistance from the person that's selling it to you? And again, this is a question that some of us can't resist. I'm one of them, I can say, is how bad do I want it? You know, and in the frenzy buying that's going on these days with the demand that exists, um, this this is a pretty important question that can get us in trouble sometimes, but it's something if we think about, we can make a better decision. And the last thing is, is this animal priced in accordance with the risk that I'm taking for buying it? Just because an animal doesn't have a warranty doesn't mean it's not worth buying but it probably should be a little less expensive than one that does have a warranty. You know, is the animal that I'm buying coming with some background information? Do I know how old it is? Do I know if it's had a baby in the past? Um, or is it coming with no information whatsoever? Is it heavy bred? And so the, the animal that you're buying, people like to think of a kudu. Let's just say a kudu is a kudu is a kudu is a kudu, and they think that there's one price for all of them. And that's just simply not the case. You know, if you're buying an eight-month-old animal versus an 18-month-old animal versus a nine-year-old animal, these animals should not be priced the same amount. But in the way that the industry has operated for a long time, that is how it's worked. And so I would encourage you through information and asking yourself questions, you, you are going to have a little bit better leverage in your ability to negotiate when you're buying. Now let's talk about selling. So I'm of the belief, as I said, that if I can't liquidate, this is not an investment. If I don't have the ability to get rid of what it is that I'm breeding, I can't really consider this as as a liquid asset or as an investable asset. And so there's three ways to sell animals. You can sell them directly to another landowner, you can sell them to a broker, or you can sell them at an auction. And again, knowing the pros and cons does matter. So if you're dealing directly to the landowner when you're selling, you're gonna sell at retail. So you're gonna have the benefit of getting a higher price. So the benefits are you're gonna manage the transaction, you're gonna get paid more, and you get to decide who you wanna deal with because maybe you don't wanna deal with everybody. Maybe maybe you don't wanna deal with 20 different people. Maybe you just wanna deal with one or two landowners and they're consistent in their ability to buy from you. You get the ability to control all of that. The downside is, and I, I use the word must here, and maybe that's not the right word, but 
If you're a landowner and you're catching your animals and then you're selling your animals to someone and they call you and say, hey, that animal died two days after you delivered it, you may not warranty it, but you're gonna to have to live with the repercussions of that, which is someone is not gonna be talking very favorably about you. Their chances are they're not gonna to wanna to buy from you anymore. There are downsides to it. So must may be a strong word, but more and more and more, we're starting to see that warranties are in fact expected. You are gonna carry the, the risk of death loss related to capture. So if you're a landowner and you're trying to sell your animals at retail, you've gotta figure out how to go out and catch that animal. And I will be the first to tell you catching animals is a, it is a science. It is not as simple as shooting a dart. Um, the one thing I'll say about that is, <clears throat> as you may not all agree with me, but as human beings, we have an instinct um, to hunt, to, to, go, to go get it and to get a hold of it. And I'll give you a quick story. The very first animal I ever darted was a Nile lechway. And it's kind of a funny story. I, I bought some Nile lechway bulls. <clears throat> one of them had a bad leg. So my brother and my dad and I, we decided we were gonna go get it. And I had BAM and a dart gun and I was ready. And so we went up this canyon and we found the Niles and <clears throat> this poor Nile, it ran and ran and ran and I didn't know anything about capture myopathy or getting hot. It was like 100 degrees this particular day. And so the long and the short, we shot like four or five times. We didn't hit it. So I put my dad at the end of this canyon with the dart gun, because I'm gonna give him the experience of getting to dart an animal. And my brother and I are pushing this Nile up the canyon and I'm screaming, dad, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And all of a sudden I hear the dart gun go off and my dad yells, I got it. And he shoots this thing straight in the throat. And so, you know, we're happy. We don't know any better. We have no idea what we're doing. No one was there to teach us anything. And so, needless to say, the Nile didn't live. It, it did go to sleep. It just stayed that way. And, and so, so I estimate that I probably spent somewhere between a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars learning to catch animals. And Tad would tell you, I still don't know what I'm doing. And, and so you do carry the risk of death loss. And I will tell you, this is a significant risk if you're not well-versed in catching animals. And then you have to manage the deliveries of what it is that you're selling, which means that you need a trailer or you need somebody with a trailer in order to do this for you. So brokers, so my first experience with trying to sell animals was, I didn't know where to sell them. So who did I call? Well, I called the brokers I'd been buying animals from and I quickly found out they were gonna pay me a whopping 25% of what I had paid for the animals to begin with. Well, I, I was a sucker, so I went for it. So the long and the short of it is, is that I, I've gone down this road as well. And the pros of working with a broker are is that they do the capture work. And there are some really, really good capture people. There are some people that really know what they're doing. You can force them to maintain the risk of death loss. It's your land, it's your ranch, and it's your animal. So if you're gonna work with a broker that's buying animals from you, it doesn't make any sense to let them catch your animals if they're not gonna take responsibility for death loss. They're the ones on your property. They're the ones making the margin between the wholesale and the retail price. And so you can make them carry the death loss if you choose to do so. Then again, they have to manage the deliveries and you don't have to provide the warranty. You sell them the animal from the time it leaves the ranch, it's on their back. The downside is, is that you're gonna have somebody on your property and then there's that added risk of that check being made of rubber. It may not, may not cash. Um, there are risk of accidents and you're only gonna get paid wholesale. And then some brokers, they either cannot or they will not offer the risk of death loss. In other words, when I say cannot, you know, we're talking about animals that are 40 grand or 20 grand or 15 grand, whatever the number is. And so a lot of these brokers, they're just working. They're just independent guys. They're out working, they're making a living. You know, they're doing well to take care of their families. And if an animal that's $30,000 dies, they simply don't have the resources to be able to carry that. And it's not malicious or crappy or mean. It's just financially, they're just not in the position to do it. And so um, one of the downsides is, is that they simply can't or they won't offer uh, the, the risk of death loss. So another one is going to be auctions. You can sell your animals at auctions. And this could be below retail or it could be above wholesale. The upside is, is that you can get a really, really high price 
So there are auctions out there where you can consign animals. There's online auctions. There is another, there's a kind of a group of ranchers that have come together and they are taking consignments. Um, some of the prices have been astronomical, like crazy off the wall, over the top high. And so you could get that benefit. Um, you don't generally have to offer a warranty when you're selling at an auction, particularly if it's an anonymous auction. And the downside is, is that you're going to have to capture it. You're going to pay a 10% plus or minus commission. And you could also get a very low price. I've seen animals that should have sold for X sell for 50% of that because an auction is only as good as the people that are there bidding. And so if you don't have the bidders there, you don't get the price. So the purchasing and liquidation summary is understanding the difference between wholesale and retail, you know, making choices based on convenience, risk tolerant, and your investment strategy, deciding if a warranty and disclosure matters to you, and determining who's going to be responsible for carrying the risk. And so this little paragraph I hear it basically says, look, there, there is no right way or wrong way. Every one of us is operating under a little bit of a different model. And so you need to make a decision for yourself what is best for you. What, what may be best for you is that you like buying at auctions because it's fun. There's some element of excitement and you like doing that. Or you may say, I don't like buying from auctions and I only want to deal directly with landowners. The flip side is when it comes to selling, you may want to go out and shoot an Isle Etchway in the throat and learn how to catch animals. You might want to do that. Um, the flip side is you might not. I've also got a hole in my thigh from a fallow buck um, that damn near killed me. And so it's, it's just a matter of either how stupid you are like me or, or how conservative you are where you don't want to take these risks. And so the thing that I'm trying to encourage you to do today is understand the market as it relates to buying and understand the market related to selling understanding retail and wholesale, and then making a decision about what, what works best for you. I know what works best for me, and that may not be best for you. And we would be more than happy to give you some more information about these things if you would like. But my, my hope is to encourage you just to think a little bit more, because the, the more you, you tailor this to your needs, the more successful and the more enjoyable your particular business will be. Okay, so I have handed out this tax implications sheet, and I think this is really important. People have asked me quite a bit about the tax implications related to non-native wildlife, and this is really small up here. Um, you should have gotten a handout, and I'm just, I'm not going to go over this whole thing, but I am going to go over this just a little bit. So, um, there is a concept in business um, called depreciation, and depreciation essentially means that I bought an asset, and the asset over time is going to lose its value, and therefore the IRS allows us to take depreciation. And historically, there's been a schedule related to depreciation that may be three years, five years, seven years, or uh, there's, there's a number of different time frames that depreciations work, okay? And so the, the tax code that this falls under is section 179 and 168K. And wh why is this important? Well, it's important because we're trying to run a business on our ranch. This isn't just a hobby or fun, it's a business. And if you own another company and you're paying a lot of tax, these animals are 100% tax deductible against other income. So if you're making a ton of money through a construction company or an oil business or whatever kind of business it is that you might have, your ranch and your breeding operation has the capability of directly reducing your tax liability to the IRS simply because you're buying non-native wildlife. So this is an excerpt from the tax code. It's not in the exact format of the code, but this is the, it's the summary of the information. So what property qualifies for section 179 deductions? And the first thing it says is that it must be eligible property. So what is eligible property? And if you go down under the classification of eligible property, you're gonna see that number seven says tangible property. <clears throat> and I'm sure you guys love the tax code and how it works. They have these steps that you get through to make it as confusing as can be. But the long and the short of it is eligible property is in fact tangible property. So what is tangible property? If you look directly below, it's got the breakdown for tangible property. And the fourth bullet says livestock, including horses, cattle, hogs, sheep, goats, mink, and other fur-bearing animals. But the key word here is livestock. 
And so if you go to the back side of this, <clears throat> and you look under the section that is talking about grain bins, it says a single purpose agricultural or a livestock or horticultural structure is a qualifying property for the purposes of 179 expense deduction. And so this next little part here is talking about barns and fences and feeding structures and things like that. So not only are the animals that we're dealing with tax deductible in the first year, but the other things that we're constructing on our ranches in order to house them, a giraffe barn or a shelter like what Joe builds, these things are in fact deductible as well. And so, the and you could read that in detail, it goes into talking about buildings, et cetera. But the last part of this is, is that you have livestock being designated as being tax deductible in the federal tax code. And then when you look at the state ag code, which this is the state of Texas, you often hear the EWA talking about livestock or exotic wildlife are deemed as livestock in the, in the state of Texas. And you hear that thrown around a lot, but I don't know that I've ever seen it printed anywhere as far as what the, tax, what the ag code actually says. So I've pulled an excerpt here, and if you look at the very bottom, it says Texas ag code and it has section 1.003 definitions, and then it goes to number three and it says livestock. And it goes into saying means cattle, horses, mules, asses, sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, exotic livestock. So there's another definition within the Ag Code for exotic livestock, and that is section 142.001, and it goes on to say exotic livestock means and you could read through this, but the bottom line is it says ungulates and antelope and deer, etc. So the moral of the story is this. Under the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was put in place, um, what they did is they accelerated depreciation. When I started Wildlife Partners, depreciation at that time was limited. I think it was a million, Corey, it was a million bucks. It was a million dollars was the max deduction that you could take in a year. And you got 50% in the first year, and then the rest you got over five years. When Tax Cut and Jobs Act passed in 17, they eliminated the limit. So there is no limit anymore. If you make $100 million and you buy $100 million worth of animals, you own $100 million worth of animals, but you don't have to pay the IRS any tax. And so they accelerated the schedule to where it's 100% in the first year. And it's been that way since 2017. And 2022 is the last year that it's 100%. It then phases down to, I believe, 90%. And then over eight or 10 years, it goes back to the original five-year schedule, which there's a lot of belief that there will be an amendment or there'll be a new bill or there'll be new legislation that maintains the 2017 uh, rules, which you know is helping depreciation today. But the, the long and the short of what I'm attempting to express regarding this is that if you own a ranch, and it's just a ranch, it's your vacation property, it's where you go hang out, it's where you do things and you goof off and you have fun time with your family and friends. You might run some cows out there to try to make it look like a business, or maybe you take a customer out to shoot a white-tailed deer, the IRS knows this game. Like, they figured it out a long time ago. You have a vacation property is what you have. And vacation properties are not deductible. But if you have a, a breeding operation on your ranch where you are breeding livestock in a meaningful way, then you actually have a business. And the idea to that business is, is that you generate revenue through the sale of offspring, or maybe you sell hunts. But the long and the short of it is, is the assets that you're buying related to animals and the structures you're building related to taking care of those animals are 100% tax deductible against other income. So if just if you're in the top tax bracket, federally speaking, the, currently the top tax rate is 37.5%. So you made a million dollars, 375,000 of that is going to Uncle Sam and you will never see it again. But if you take a million bucks and you go buy exotic wildlife, your animals are still worth a million dollars, but you don't have to give Uncle Sam 375 grand. So that's the long and the short of the tax aspects. If you have questions about this after this meeting, um, feel free to ask me and I'll introduce you to some tax counsel that can help you with this. Um, this is why I got into this to begin with, and this is an incredible strategy from an investment standpoint that's wildly beneficial if you structure your, your business correctly. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about market performance. This is one of my favorite subjects, and it's really made my business really easy. So everybody knows animal values have gone up, and people don't really know why, they just know they have. <clears throat> but this chart is designed to give you an idea of what's gone on with animal values going back to 2012. And I'm using 2012 because that's when I started doing this. <clears throat> so if you, the first animal that's shown here is a sable, and if you look at sable in 2012, sable, if you bought a female sable, and these are all female prices, if you bought a female sable, it was gonna be somewhere between seven and $9,000 in 2012. So when I first got started, that's, I paid $9,000 for the first sable female I bought. <clears throat> then if you watch this jump, we're here, if you watch this jump, they go to 10, and then they go to 17.5, then they go to 22.5, then they go to 27.5, and currently in 2021, sable females are selling for 45,000 or more. So a mature female sable today is gonna to cost you about 45 grand at retail. That's delivered to your ranch with a warranty. So that's a 463% return on just the animal you bought. This does not take into consideration the offspring and it doesn't take into consideration the tax savings because the $9,000 was tax deductible. So the 9,000 is not actually what your basis is in the animal, your basis is closer to 6,000. And so your $6,000 has turned into 45 grand between 2012 and 2021. If you look at Kudu, they have gone up 400%, Impala 357%, Black Wildebeest 567%, and Yala 800% and Grant's Gazelles 355%. And I can go through this exercise with virtually every single species of super exotics, all of them, every, every one of them. The only exception to this is right over here. And these are your commons, your axis, your black buck, your fallow are kind of starting to break out, um, Audad, scimitar, oryx. You do not see the appreciation related to super exotics. It's just not there. So the question is, why? This market is the entry point for people getting into the industry. Buying Axis, Black Buck, Fallow, this is like, it's easy. It's just, it's a few hundred dollars to buy females. It's where you put your toe in the water. It's where you get started. They also have the highest populations of all of the animals that exist as it relates to exotics. But the main driver to this is hunting. This, this is the main driver to these animals. The, the biggest factor driving prices on this area is going to be the hunting market. And if you look at prices related to hunting, they are not doing this. They've had a slight incline here over the last couple of years, but generally they've been, they've been pretty flat. You're not seeing this huge astronomical increase in the demand for hunting. And these animals are really driven by the hunting market because of the trophies related to them. And so you've seen some increases, but they're just not astronomical. Today, you know, Axis, Black Buck, Axis are up about 117% since 2012. I mean, that's not terrible, but it's, it's not what you're seeing over on this side. My brother and I put these together because we have an investment business as well, and we like to show people from an investment standpoint, how does this actually play out? So if you were to go from a black wildebeest standpoint and buy one male and five females, which by the way, you can't, they're just not available, but I'm using this as an example, you got 10 grand in your male and you have 225,000 in your females. This is retail. So you're a retail buyer, Okay, and you're a wholesale seller. In other words, you're buying delivered to your ranch. You don't know how to catch an animal and you don't have a customer to sell it to. So you've got someone like us coming in and buying it. So your cost is $235,000. So your potential cash flow, if you get one offspring, offspring per female, if you get one offspring per year, the total offspring a year at an 80% rate is two males and two females. So out of your five cows, you're not getting 100% production, you're only getting 80%, and you're getting one, two males and two females. Your, your males, you're gonna sell at wholesale. So that's 25% less than the retail price. So you're gonna get 15 grand out of your male offspring, and your females, you're selling at 35 grand, which is $10,000 less than retail. 
So you've got 70 grand in income from your two females. So you've recovered $85,000 of your investment in the first year, not including your tax benefits. So 235 grand when you take 37.5% off for taxes. Now this doesn't factor in feed and it doesn't factor in your land, but you're gonna have, let's just call it somewhere in the range of 150 grand as your break even, okay, on, on the animals you bought. But you're getting 85 grand back in the first, well, at the, we'll call it in the second year because your babies have to get born and wean and all that sort of stuff. But this is a 30, 36% cash flow, cash on cash, but when you're looking at it from a tax standpoint, it's 50%. But you still own these animals if you've kept them alive. So you still own your initial investment, but in addition to that, you've gotten half of your money back in the way of tax savings and in revenue. So the message that I shared when I first got started doing this is that <clears throat> this, has not, this is not new. Like, I've taken a play out of somebody else's playbook. So I started doing this in 2012 for fun, for tax write-offs and to goof off and be a redneck. And then I went to Africa. And when I got to Africa in 2014, I toured breeding farms. And what I realized while I was there was these people are printing money. Like I just couldn't get over what I was seeing. It was, it was unbelievable. I, it was just, I was driving around the ranch and there were hundreds of millions of dollars of animals on this one particular ranch. There was a, a Cape Buffalo that had been sold for $11 million for one buffalo. And it was, a, it was a huge industry. And so what this demonstrates is that in 1965, outside of national parks, wildlife in South Africa was damn near extinct. You don't realize that. Like we think of Africa as this place teeming with wildlife, but they did this thing called farming and they're trying to feed all these hungry people, and so they eradicated wildlife on private property because it was more profitable to raise cows and goats and corn than it was to let native wildlife live on their land. But then in 1990, it was estimated that there were about 100,000 animals left in South Africa. It may have been a little more than that when you factor in national parks, let's call it 300,000. In 1991, the, the, the government in South Africa realized something, and what they realized was that if we privatize wildlife, investors will come to the party and they'll fix this problem. So they created legislation called the Game Theft Act and what they did is they told landowners if it's on your land, you own it. You can do whatever you want to do with it. You can do photo safaris, you can be a breeder, you can be a hunter, you can sell it for meat, you can do whatever you want. And if somebody tries to steal it, you can protect your assets. And so what happened between 1991 and 2012 50 million acres of marginal farmland was converted into wildlife habitat. All these cows and sheep and goats and corn got wiped out and instead people started raising wildlife because it was more profitable. <clears throat> so there was $14.5 billion invested between 91 and 2012. In 2014, it was estimated that there were $300 million worth of animals sold in South Africa alone. And in March of 2016, I started this company in April of 2016, I met a man by the name of Norman Adamy, and Norman was the owner of Miller Brewing Company in South Africa. He was the CEO here in the US. He is one of the most successful game farmers in South Africa. His business partner is the president, as well as a, another group of people. And he was speaking at an EWA conference, and he talked about uh, raising um, wildlife was 2.8 times more lucrative than raising cattle. And I had been to Africa, I'd seen everything that was going on there, and here I am listening to this guy that's extraordinarily successful. He's a very astute businessman, and he traveled to the United States to tell us that this is a better deal than cows. And so Wildlife Partners was started shortly thereafter. And then in 2018, we're going from 1991 to 2018, 27 years. In 2018, it was estimated that there was somewhere around 25 to 28 million animals in South Africa. And that's when the market turned. And so the market from 1991 to 2018 saw 20% compounding growth every year all the way through that cycle. 
There was an enormous amount of money made in South Africa. There were huge ranches that were paid for as the result of breeding wildlife. 50 million acres of land was converted into breeding farms. $14.5 billion of investment was made. But the most important part of this, aside from the money, is that they went from having 100,000 animals to 28 million. And it, it gives me goosebumps to, to think about the impact on wildlife that that has. Pri privatization, people like you and me that have a capitalistic mindset have the capability of doing amazing things. And when you look at Texas, we're in our infancy compared to this cycle. If you look at where we are in the cycle, we're probably 1993 as it relates to South Africa when you look at population numbers. And I'll go over that here in just a minute. So we're going to talk about kudu, and people talk about, well, how long can it last? How long can the prices work? How long is this going to be a stable market? And what I've done is that I've done an enormous amount of research. It's not scientific research. It's just reading and talking to people, traveling all over the United States, meeting with landowners, doing a huge amount of homework on data. And what most people don't realize is that kudu here, if you look at the AZA zoo population, the AZA is the Association of Zoos and Aquarium. They have been the primary source of where our, our original animals came from, and they are a continual source today. But the population of kudu in the AZA is 60 males and 119 females. So the first point I like to make about this is, how do you think they got this disproportionate number? There's, there's only 60 males, but 119 females. So where do you think those excess males are going? They're, they're on a trailer and they're coming to Texas. So when you go to San Diego Safari Park and you're looking at all those animals out there or you go to Disney Animal Kingdom or you go to San Antonio Zoo or you go to Lincoln Park Zoo or the Bronx Zoo or any of these zoos and you see those little baby animals running around out there, not all of them, but a large portion of them are going to end up in Texas. It's, it's a dirty little secret that zoos don't want anybody to know, particularly when they bash Texas ranches. But this is the reality of what goes on today, and it's gone on for decades. And thank God for them. It's a shame that they can't own what they've done because they've created this amazing conservation story that exists here in Texas. <clears throat> but the bottom line is, is that when you look at the founding population, they are saying that there are a total of 44 founders. Now, there could be some... There could be some inaccuracy to this. There may be some other animals that have been imported that, that are not recorded that was talked about a little bit earlier. There may have been some private imports or maybe animals came through Mexico. Or um, The bottom line is, based on these records, 44 animals were brought into the United States from the wild. So if you look at the population in Texas, I've done a lot of homework on this. I work with a lot of landowners. I have a pretty good idea how many of these animals exist here in the state. And what I did before this meeting is that I called some of the largest brokers in the state and I asked them what their thoughts were. How, how many animals do you think exist here in the state? And the, the general number is somewhere between three and 5,000 kudu. That's males and females. So the next question is, if you're looking at market stability is, well, how many of them are available for sale? Because at the end of the day, the market stability is based on supply and demand, okay? So it is estimated, and I'm gonna tell you this is a high number. If you're talking about female kudu, which is what you've seen these huge increases in price related to, there are less than 50 female kudu sold each month. Fewer, it's probably 30, if I'm really being honest. So when you think about this and you say, there's more than 5,000 landowners in Texas that have exotics on their ranches. And then you have this huge group of deer breeders and you have this huge group of just other wildlife enthusiasts that love wildlife and they all want kudu. And so when there's only 30 of them available each month and the people that are buying them, they have all the money in the world to spend. That's what's causing these prices to go up. What's causing the prices to go up is this. Supply is extraordinarily limited. And these animals here, the three to 5,000, if, if you know much about landowners in Texas that own these animals, by and large, most of them are very successful, they're very wealthy, and they don't need money. They don't sell their gun collection, they don't sell their coin collection, they don't sell their car collections, they don't sell anything. 
that they love. They don't want to let go of it. And so the only reason that they're selling these animals is because Jared Steinbach is harassing them until they do. Or, or their land is in a position where they can no longer sustain having them on the land because it's getting overgrazed. And so the supply coming into the marketplace is extremely limited. And the last piece of this particular species is there's no leverage. The people buying these animals are not they're not borrowing money to buy them. So there's never gonna be a situation where the bank shows up to foreclose and fire sales these things. These animals are paid for with cash. And so when you see a significant drop in a market or massive liquidation, that's generally is the result of someone getting in a bind. Well, there's no one large enough as it relates to these species to, to put a glut into the market. And even if they did, it would just simply be a temporary, a temporary dip. So if you're talking about kudu, where, where does this number have to get before we see a decline in value? And I don't have an answer to that question, but I can tell you it's not anytime soon. <clears throat> when you talk about Roan, the AZA has 40 males and 60 females. It's estimated there's 16 founders, 16. So unless some came in somewhere else, there's only 16 animals that have ever brought into the US. The estimated population is less than 1,000, and there are less than 10 of these sold on a monthly basis. It's not 10, I can promise you. As it relates to female roan, there are not 10 female roans sold every month. It's, it's, it's maybe three at the most. It, it may not even be that many. Sable, these numbers are very similar to kudu. There's 34 males and 82 females in the AZA. There's 39 founders. Three to 5,000, and there are less than 50 sold on a monthly basis. And this, again, we're talking about females. Then we have Nyala, 28 males and 70 females. There are 18 founders, 2,500 to 3,500 animals, and there's fewer than 50 of these females being sold on a monthly basis. <clears throat> Springbok, the number is less than 20 females that are available on a monthly basis. So, when you're talking about the supply and demand of the exotic wildlife industry and what does it look like for the future, this is a 50-year-old industry. It's more than 50 years old, and it is made up of the wealthy and the elite. Doesn't mean that there's not some people that are not wealthy doing this, but as a general rule, the people that are driving this industry are very well healed from a financial standpoint. There are more than 5,000 ranches. It is a very large industry. It is estimated to be north of $3 billion as it relates to economic impact today. And you have lots and lots and lots of ranches that are converting from domestic livestock to exotic wildlife. You have a lot of deer breeders that are converting from being deer breeders to exotics. You have deer breeders that are, are their breeders and they're gonna stay breeders, but now they're diversifying into exotics. And, and so you have this massive growth, which is identical to what South Africa saw. They saw this huge explosion in land that was being devoted to wildlife. And tax reform in 2017, it would be remiss to ignore this. The fact that this is 100% tax deductible in the first year is playing a role as it relates to the market. Again, you have a very limited supply. The number is, we'll just call it 100,000. It may be 150,000, it may be 75. There's a very limited number of super exotic species. It's not big, it's, it's a small number. <clears throat> the animals, again, they originated from zoos, and this is one of the key driving factors. On a weekly basis, I get emails or Facebook messages from people in Africa asking us to import animals into the United States. Carrie will talk to you about it. You can't put a Cape Buffalo on an airplane and ship it to Texas. You, you can't. And if you're a landowner in Texas and you have all the money in the world, you still can't do it because of hoof and mouth disease. So the only imports that have really existed here over the last few years, or I say few, we'll call it 10 years, have been animals being imported into zoos from other zoos. In other words, a European zoo importing Takin to San Diego Zoo occurred about a year and a half ago. But this is a zoo-born animal. It's not an animal carrying any kind of an illness, which Kerry talked a little bit about the impact of illness on imports. It's a big deal because we're trying to protect our food supply. But this, this fact here, the fact that you cannot import anything is a huge driver as it relates to the stability of our market. So if someone asked me, do I wanna import animals from South Africa? The answer is no. No, I don't wanna do that. Do I want to import semen? God bless America, I do. 
We need the diversity from a genetic standpoint, but I have no desire to saturate our market with imports at all. I don't have any reason to do that. <clears throat> so many landowners are reluctant to sell. As I said, this is another driving factor in why it is that the market is skyrocketing is that the clientele related to this industry, it's like pulling teeth to get them to sell. They, they simply don't want to do it. And there's, I know there's several people in this room that have experienced the badgering of Brian Gilroy trying to buy your animals or Jared or some of the other people that work for us. We are relentless and we're relentless because you're stubborn. We, we, we really want you to sell them to us. Um, and so that is playing a huge role in this market. So price and stability. So again, over the last year, the past several years, prices have soared with no imports and breeding as being the only mechanism to grow Future and current supply is extremely limited. And when you consider that they grow attached and they don't need the revenue, they're reluctant to sell these females. And this has created a lack of availability in an already skyrocketing market. Tax deductibility adds to the demand. And as long as depreciation exists. So I want to touch on this just a little bit is that <clears throat> let's say I'm a business owner and I have a ranch and I decide to do this. And I go out and my first acquisition is Axis and Black Buck. And I put my toe in the water and I figure out, okay, this works. I, I like it. And then the next year comes around and I've got this great big tax bill and I decide I need to buy a half a million dollars worth of animals. So I go out and I buy Bless Buck and I buy Scimitar Oryx. And then the next year I make a lot of money again and I don't buy Bless Bach and Scimitar Oryx or Axis or Black Buck, now I buy Red Letchway and I buy Eland. And then the next year I buy Kudu and I buy Sable. And so when you, when you talk about the diversification in the market and the stability of the supply and demand is that you have a customer that enters into the market. This is not a one-time buy. They're not buying one time to cover themselves on taxes or to stock their ranch. These people are buying over a period of a decade or longer. And because you have this diversification of 60 or 70 species, you, you have the capability of continuing to shelter income from a tax standpoint, and you're not buying the same thing. You get a new toy every year. And so this all plays a role into the stability of the market. But the last thing is, and this is I think my last slide, so our company is a little different than all the other companies that are out there. And frankly, no one has ever, in the last six years, no one has stepped up and copied our business model. And it's gonna happen at some point, but it hasn't happened yet. And what, what our company did is that we recognized that the personalities in this room, the people that are here and the customers that we work with here in Texas, landowners, these personalities exist in other states. They don't just live in Texas. I mean, there's big egos elsewhere. and so. You like that, huh, bud? <laughs> so, so the reality is, is I, I thought, you know, if we can go out and find the same personality that's buying the animals in Texas on putting them on their ranch and, and give them access to land here in Texas, they're going to join this industry. In other words, if we can lower the bar for them to get in, they're going to come to the party. And so my brother and I created a product, and what the product is is we form a partnership and initially we would raise $5 million and it would be a small group of investors that would own the group of animals and it may have been 300 or 400 animals to start and we let them use our land. So their animals live on our land and we take care of them for them. And the benefit we get is we're selling them the animal at retail and so we're making a spread and then they pay us to use our land and then we buy all the offspring from them at wholesale and so we make money on the way out as well. But we make all these amazing friends. They get to come down and have their own little safari on our ranch and stay in the lodges. And we created this product. And initially, we just did it internally. We raised the capital on our own. But we decided two years ago that we had produced good enough returns and that we knew enough about what we were doing that we would go out to financial services firms, companies that sell investment products, and we would introduce them to this product and see what happens. And that's what we did. And so this year alone, the long and the short of it is the number is greater than this. I have $50 million here. But if you, if you look at the buying pressure 
that exists today in the industry, it is not just from you guys. It's not just from Texas landowners. Our company has brought in outside buyers that don't own land. And the number exceeds $50 million today that they've put into the industry. This, this year alone, those firms are gonna have raised somewhere around 20, 20 or $22 million just through our company to buy exotic wildlife in Texas to live on the ranches that we have. And where we're at is we're having to restrict them. They, they would raise 50 or $100 million if we would let them and if we could find the animals. And so the reason I go over this is that when people ask me about market stability and they wanna know how long is this gonna last? How long are these prices gonna stay up? My, my answer is really simple. It is basic supply and demand. It, that's really what it comes down to. Today, right now, supply is extraordinarily limited. It's very, very limited, and I can show you all the reasons why it's very limited. Demand is astronomical, and it's astronomical because this is 100% tax deductible, and it is, it is growing rapidly from outside of the state because people have figured out that exotic wildlife is an investable asset, and it does have the capability of producing revenue, and it's a lot of fun. And if you're like me, when you think about what it's doing for wildlife, it, it brings you to tears. It's an amazing experience to be able to impact our world and our animals um, in a very positive way. And so my answer for market stability is really simple. I can give you data and I can give you information. It, it is going to fall at some point. I just don't think it's anytime soon. If you look at the South African model, it took 27 years before there was a massive decline. We've got at least 20 years in front of us from my perspective. And as long as animals that we're buying are 100% tax deductible, I do not see any, any decline in demand. I don't see any way in which people are gonna stop buying these animals because the people that have tax problems always have tax problems. Doesn't matter whether the economy is up or the economy is down, the haves always have. And so my, the summary of my little presentation here is that I believe that we're in a wonderful time related to exotic wildlife. I think the fact that you're present here today is a great indication of the desire that we all have to do better from a management standpoint. And the fact that we've all figured out that these assets are in fact valuable and that they can be very beneficial for our ranches and for our pocketbooks. And so I really appreciate you coming today. And if you have additional questions, um, please feel free to grab me afterward and ask any questions you might have. But um, I wanna just thank you for being a part of what we're all doing. And thank you for being a part of making this industry a better place. And I hope that you will make use not only of our company, but that you'll make use of all of the other speakers that came here today, as well as Texas A&M to continue to make the overall industry a better place. So thank you very much for being here.